Hey everyone, my name is Chelsea. Welcome to Little Mountain Ranch. Welcome to my kitchen. I'm really happy to have you here with us today. Today I'm going to be sharing with you all the things that I do for my family when they are feeling under the weather. So there's probably going to be maybe four different recipes of things and then I'm going to show you what I'm making for dinner tonight. Everyone is on the mend, <clears throat> excuse me, from a very bad cold that we've had over the last five days and I want to make them something a little bit more substantial that will stick to their bones for dinner tonight. So I'm gonna share all of that with you today. First, I'm going to take a drink of my honey. This is honey, lemon juice, water, and a chunk of garlic in it because my throat, even though I'm feeling 100% better in every other way, is still a little bit scratchy and this really, really helps to kind of soothe the sore throat. Even though I am a firm believer that a lot of the things that I do to help my family to feel better when they're not feeling well actually does help them on a physical level, I also believe that a large percentage of what helps them feel better by doing these things, making the effort to make something warm and nourishing or something that's just going to make them feel cared for has a huge part to play in the um, effectiveness of, the, of whatever it is I'm doing for them. Whenever someone is just feeling unwell, there's a vulnerability that comes with that and being cared for by someone or having someone give you something and say, oh, take a few sips of this, this will help you feel better, I think impacts us and causes us to feel better even if the physical um, result of whatever you're taking isn't really doing much, if that makes sense. So I think that there's two components. One is obviously nourishing our bodies when we're not feeling well is a good thing, especially with good, healthy food. But, um, but the emotional aspect of it, I think, plays a huge part in it too. So what we're gonna do first off is make an electrolytes drink, a really simple electrolytes drinks. So I am not a medical professional, so when it comes to the specific details about why taking electrolytes when you've had a fever are important, you'll have to do your own research on that. But uh, the one thing that I can tell you is that when you have a fever, you're, you sweat a lot and you end up losing the water out of your body and also the salt, both of those things are obviously really important to healing. So anything that we can do to up our electrolyte levels when we aren't feeling well, especially if we have a fever and we're sweating a lot, is a good idea. I am going to use frozen strawberries in mine. If somebody has a fever, sometimes drinking something really cold can make them feel shivery and awful. So using um, either thawing your strawberries or using fresh strawberries can be a better option if somebody's really shivery. Where is my measuring cup? I will put the recipe for this down in the show notes for you. So I am going to add two cups of frozen strawberries. Half a teaspoon of salt. Okay, and then I'm going to add some honey. And in this case, I'm going to add a little bit of the honey out of my fermented garlic. We'll talk more about this and how to make this in a few minutes. But during this entire cold, I took one chunk of this garlic in morning and night. Dan said I was very strong smelling <laughs> with doing that. Garlic is very strong. So I'm gonna add, I don't know, a good tablespoon. When garlic is fermented in honey like this, it actually becomes quite sweet and more candy flavor. It doesn't have that strong flavor of raw garlic. I'm just going to fill this up with water. So like I said, this is a super simple recipe. You may be tempted to add some yogurt or milk or something like that, but if you have a chest congestion, I always try to stay away from uh, milk. You can get really fancy with electrolyte drinks if you look them up online. There's all kinds of different recipes, but I find just a simple one like this. As soon as somebody drinks this when they're feeling really awful, usually it'll give them a little bit of energy and just kind of make them feel overall a little bit better. I think I'm actually gonna add a little bit more honey to this. I'm just gonna run downstairs and grab some of my honey. I have this stuff here, which is just store-bought 
unpasteurized honey, but I think for this, I'm going to add my own to it. There we go. Our honey this year was so light and really floral. It's delicious. So I'm going to take a tablespoon out of here. I prefer to use whole fruit in my drinks rather than fruit juice, but you could totally use orange juice or uh, lemon juice. And if you have the opportunity to use fresh squeezed, then that's even better. And I blend this up quite smooth so there's no chunks in it. So what I'm doing here is I'm actually just letting all the fruit settle a little bit and all the air come out of it and then I'll scoop off the foam off the top and then I'll pour it into my cups. And while that's happening over here, I'll show you this store-bought tea that I also use. I bought a case of this last year, I think, and it's eucalyptus mint specifically designed for chest congestion. So what I do with this tea is heat up the water, of course, and then into this, I'm going to add a little bit of honey as well. And then I'll just make this teapot and set it on the counter. And then if anybody feels like they'd like to have some, then they can just come and help themselves. So a good size tablespoon of honey into the teapot. <clears throat> Isn't this pretty? Whoa, <laughs> don't want to drop it, good grief. This is a um, thrifted teapot and I just love it. But one of the things that my kids pointed out, which I thought was pretty funny, is there, these are peaches on here and then there's a flower on here. And I can't remember who it was that pointed this out, but they said that, well, that's weird because uh, trees don't have flowers and fruit on at the same time, or at least peach trees don't. So I just said, well, they just took creative license with it. That's okay. <laughs> okay. So into this, this tea is really strong. So into this, I'm just going to throw two tea bags, let them steep for about five minutes or so, and then I'll pull the tea bags out. Otherwise it gets too strong for kids. We'll set that aside over there. And most of the foam is off that now, so I'm just going to give this a little bit of a light stir just because the strawberry pulp, some of it has sunk to the bottom. Add a couple of frozen strawberries to each cup. Don't they look pretty? Okay, I'm just gonna go pass all these around. I'll be right back. Okay, we're gonna put this back into the freezer and then run down to the pantry and grab some bone broth because we're going to make a really simple soup, just a vegetable chicken soup. When my kids were right in the thick of being really sick, I just made the bone broth just a clear bone broth. I didn't add anything to it. But since everyone is on the mend now, I am going to make one that has a little bit more substance. So we're gonna use some chicken, some potatoes, need our broth, and we'll throw in some beans. And since I don't want to chop some veggies right now. I'm going to grab some frozen veggies. Okay, this soup could not be easier. So even if you're feeling unwell yourself, you could throw a soup like this together quite easily. Oh, that broth smells so good. Making a bone broth is quite easy. I always like to roast my bones. So if you have, say you've had a roasted chicken, you can take the bones and roast them just the bones themselves once you've taken all the meat off in the oven just until they get golden brown 
and boil them down. You can add some extra things. So in this case, this broth is actually more of a soup stock. So it has, I put onions and celery and carrots and all kinds of um, herbs when I was boiling it down and then just strained it really well before pressure canning it. The canned chicken, I'm actually going to wait and add once the vegetables are all cooked through in the soup, just so that it doesn't lose too much of its texture. Some frozen veg, as much as you like. Whenever I talk about canned potatoes, I get asked whether they get mushy. So I wanted to show you here. And as you can see, they hold up their texture perfectly. These ones are Kennebec potatoes and Pacific russet, and they look great. So I'm just going to <clears throat> cook these veggies up first before I add both the potatoes and the chicken. And it's that simple. This is the rest of the ingredients. I might add a little bit of salt if I need salt, but this is it. I forgot my beans. And if you are at the beginning of an illness, particularly if it's a tummy bug, then having just the bone broth itself without any of the added veggies. I love the taste of chicken broth when I'm not feeling well, probably because my mom made me chicken noodle soup when I was a kid. So it's just a very cozy, warm, delicious night. The saltiness when your mouth tastes all gross from being sick is really nice. The next thing that we're gonna make is a little bit of elderberry syrup. And as you can see, mine is more of a juice. I don't add tons of sweetener to it and I also don't cook it down that much. It's really, really easy to make. So we'll show you that. My elderberries are out in the freezer, so I'm just gonna grab those. These are elderberries that I froze back in August, I think it was, maybe even September. And as you can see, I have lots of elderberries. I have another bag in the freezer still. So what I'm gonna do is put these in a strainer because I froze them with the stems on, which I had heard was a really good idea because then you can just shake them up and the berries fall off really easily in the, uh, in the bag. So this, all the big stems were in here and when I did shake it up, those ones were really easy to pull out. But I have to say, I find it kind of a pain though because all the little tiny bits of the stem are still in this. So I don't think I'll do that again. I think I'll just take the time to pull the berries off before I put them in the freezer next time. But I've heard this works for some people, just not for me. If you do do it this way and you have <clears throat> the frozen berries with the bit of stems, you can give it a shake and then the stems kind of come up to the top and are a little bit easier to pull out. But yeah, I'd rather just do this at the beginning and have my berries frozen nice and clean. When it comes to food preservation, I'd rather do the work up at the front end and then have it convenient throughout the winter than give myself work later on in the season. I'm gonna use somewhere around two cups of elderberries to six cups of water. And then I will be adding some honey as a sweetener, but I'm gonna wait until my elderberry syrup cools down or elderberry juice cools down first so that I don't lose all the good nutritional properties of my raw honey. All right, I think that's as good as it's gonna get. Elderberries are one of those fruits that need to be heated before you can eat them. If you eat them raw, they can make your tummy hurt. Although I have heard from people in Europe saying that they just pick them and eat them without having any stomach issues at all. And I'm just kind of wondering if maybe the variety is different there. I'm not sure, but either way, I heat mine. So I'm going to simmer this for an hour until it's reduced by half. And then I'll show you what I do next. I always keep a couple of bags of these in the freezer over the winter time for the days like today when I don't want to be chopping veggies super convenient back in the freezer this goes i always find that after my kids have been sick especially my teenage boys they are ravenously hungry so i'm going to make a stick to your bones meal for tonight 
and also something that I know that my kids love and that is meatloaf. I made this beet meatloaf earlier on in the week and it was so delicious. Oh my gosh. <clears throat> I used a couple of ingredients in it that I haven't used before that were um, things that were new to me as far as food preservation this year. And oh my gosh, so good. So I'm going to be making two good sized meatloaves and using three pounds of ground beef. I always mention this whenever I cook with ground beef on my video, or at least in the last few weeks, that I normally will do half pork, half beef, but I don't have any pork. <clears throat> we were planning on doing our pigs this week, but with Dan having been so sick, we're gonna push it back another week. Okay, into this, we are going to add some delicious ingredients. Normally I would add three eggs, one egg per pound of beef, but I only have two eggs this morning, so two eggs it is. A mounding cup of oats, in this case quick oats. You could use old fashioned rolls too if you'd like. Now this next ingredient might seem kind of weird, but, but it does make for a really yummy meatloaf. And that is a quarter cup of mayo. So a couple of the new ingredients that I decided to experiment with earlier on in the week were tomato powders. This is the tomato powder. <laughs> this is the tomato powder that I made with the tomato skins from canning earlier in the season. This is garlic scape salt that I made. The garlic scapes are from hardneck garlic and they're the long little curly bit that comes out from the middle of garlic when you're growing it that the flower grows from. Uh, what else? And then the smoked paprika. This I truly do believe is the secret ingredient for making this taste so delicious. And then always I add a couple of pinches of uh, chili powder and some salt and some pepper. Around a tablespoon of tomato powder. All these things just smell like summer to me. A tablespoon of smoked paprika. I'm not adding too much of this because this has salt in it and I already added salt. And a pinch of chili powder. I don't add too much chili powder to it because I don't want that flavor to be overpowering. Oh, it smells amazing already. Now I'm just gonna wash my hands and then we'll get that all mixed up. Definitely the worst part of the whole thing. Really make sure that you well incorporate your seasonings. I'll often add finely minced onion to my uh, meatloaf, but I think I'm gonna skip that step for today. Our veg is all heated through. So now I'm going to add, whoops. <laughs> now I'm gonna add potatoes. And our chicken, and I'm keeping the juice in there. Just add a little extra salt stock. And our berries are simmering away over here. Put all of our seasonings away and then get it into some loaf pans. Okie dokie. So what we're gonna do here is take some of our meat mixture and put it into both pans. And then I make a little channel down the middle and put in a little bit of cheese in here. My kids love it when I do this. Generally speaking, if you have a lot of chest congestion, 
dairy isn't the best thing, but um, all my kids are on the other side of that part of this cold. And I know they will really appreciate the added little surprise inside of here. Okay, and then top it with some more of the meat mixture. And then what we're gonna do is bake this in the oven for around half an hour or so, 45 minutes at 350. And then I am going to show you how I make a really simple barbecue sauce that we're going to put on the top. Okay, to make the simplest ever barbecue sauce, we're going to start with ketchup. All my ketchups are running low right now, so I'm gonna empty all of these out. And you could also use tomato paste if you like, but you will have to add a little bit more sweetener to it. Ketchup already has a lot of sugar in it, so I'm not gonna have to add too much, just a little bit of brown sugar. You could absolutely use a store-bought barbecue sauce for this. You could get a lot fancier too with your barbecue sauce, which I do sometimes, but this is just gonna be a simple one. And <clears throat> like with all my recipes, I am working on getting all of these fine-tuned as far as measurements go. But you can just use this as kind of a inspiration for your own. And between filling my ketchup bottles with my number 10 cans of ketchup that I buy, always give them a good wash. You can use for this next ingredient, you can use prepared mustard like I'm doing, or you can use, um, or you could use a Dijon, Dijon mustard, or you could use mustard powder, just a little bit. Sometimes I'll add minced garlic, but today, since we're going for convenience, I'm gonna add garlic powder, a little bit of smoked paprika, a little bit of chili powder, a little bit of brown sugar, a good tablespoon of apple cider vinegar, actually, in this case, one and a half tablespoons. And a teaspoon of Worcestershire sauce. And then we're gonna mix this all together and get it simmering on the stove just long enough to dissolve all of the sugar. And then we will top our meatloaf with this when it has just about finished cooking. Then we'll top this with it, we'll let it bake for another 15 minutes, and then broil it for about two to three minutes. Our soup is now ready to serve, so I've just turned the heat off to let it cool down a little bit before I serve it. And normally I find that a soup like this, especially if it has potatoes in it, is enough on its own for people that are recovering from being sick. But if your kids are particularly hungry, serving it with some crackers or some buns would be nice too. While our elderberries are cooking down over there, we need to go put these back into the freezer again and then wash up these dishes. Hey guys, does anybody want some tea? I have a pot of tea down here if you'd like some. Okay, I got the dishes all done. And now we're going to mash up our elderberries. Just use a potato masher and give them a little bit of a mash. So what I'm gonna do with this is strain out with a fine mesh strainer the berries. And I think I'm gonna get a cloth to put in this so that I don't get any of the little tiny seeds and stuff in there. So now we're gonna let this cool down to room temperature before we add in our honey. Okay, now we have our meatloaf. Okay. 
And we're going to take our barbecue sauce and put half of it on one, half of it on the other. And this is totally unnecessary. You don't need to have barbecue sauce on this, but it does make it taste extra good. All right, last up, we have the fermented honey and garlic. Every time I show this on a video, I always get asked how to do it, and it could not be easier. Take a jar, chop up your fresh garlic into whatever size pieces you would like. These are really strong, so I would recommend, let me show you, I have a couple different sizes in here. This size piece that's in the middle, I would totally pop that in my mouth and eat it, no problem. I don't have an issue with eating that much garlic at once. But this size over here, and even a little bit smaller than this, would probably be good for most people, unless you really love garlic. And then like I said, this size is fine. For kids, I would say half of that would be sufficient. And so once you have your garlic all chopped up in your jar, start with a small jar at first, just to see if you like it, like a pint or even a half pint. Fill up your jar about three quarters of the way with chopped garlic and then top it off with raw honey, raw organic unpasteurized honey. If you do have access to that, it would be best. And then you just leave it for two weeks on your kitchen counter and flip it. I did it every time I'd walk past it and thought about it, but at least twice a day. And after that two week period of time, it should be done. I am just storing mine in my cold room downstairs. You could put it in the fridge if you wanted, as long as it stays relatively cool. And it will last like that for up to a year, maybe even longer. And as you can see, it kind of darkens over time and the honey gets quite a lot more runny. You can use this as a glaze on chicken would be absolutely amazing. I'm using it as a way to help to support my immune system when I'm sick. As far as the elderberry syrup goes, I have been taking, I don't know, like an ounce worth and just drinking it straight up. <laughs> oh, I do not like the taste of elderberries. Oh, not at all, I know lots of people love it. Not my flavor. Um, all, the other thing that I do with this is actually make it uh, make a tea with it. So I put echinacea. I have dried echinacea flowers in the bottom, a little bit of chamomile over here, which when opened, this jar smells like summer. Oh, smells so good. Even the smell of chamomile I find soothing. And then pour some hot water on top of that and then let it steep, strain out the flowers and then drink that. I'll probably make some tea like that later on this afternoon. While the meatloaf is finished cooking and before everyone comes to eat lunch, I am going to take you downstairs and show you where we made it on the project, the freeze dryer room project, before Dan got too sick. He actually worked valiantly through the first stages of the sickness and then it just got too bad. But it's looking so good down there already. We have a shop light set up in here that is very, very, very bright. Okay, so what we have done so far is we have insulated this wall. On the other side of this wall is our wood stove and we want this room to stay really cool. It's better to run your freeze dryer in a cool space because then it doesn't have to work so hard. This wall back here, the other side of this is the pantry and it stays quite cool already. So we're not insulating this. And likewise, we are not insulating this wall either. This is a concrete wall, so it will really help to keep it cool. Dan has framed over top of this, this framing he did a couple of days ago, because we have all of these pipes here. And at first we thought about just drywalling up right against these two by fours and then building a box for these, but it was easier and more efficient to just frame right over top of it. We are also going to be adding a vent out of up there that will come in here the same as we did over in the pantry. And it'll be an adjustable vent that we can use to control the temperature in here if we want it even cooler. There has been a change in plans since the video 
in which I showed the picture of the sketches that Dan made for this. Initially, we were going to have a freezer right beside the freeze dryer here, but in talking about it and listening to feedback from you guys who have freeze dryers, we've decided that we're actually just going to put a counter straight across this so that I have a workspace to work on to both prepare food to go into the freeze dryer and also to take it out and actually package it up. So we're gonna have shelves that run all the way up here, shelves underneath on this side of um, where the countertop, the workspace is going to be so that I can actually store my freeze dried food in this space as well. So what we're gonna do as far as having a freezer, because we also want to be able to pre-freeze our food before it goes into the freeze dryer, we ha are going to have our freezer over here. Sadly, it won't be able to be this one because we have our electrical panels and we need to have a greater distance between the electrical panels and the freezer. So we're going to buy a small freezer to fit in here and we'll move this one out of the space. Dan is already feeling so much better today. So I imagine within a couple of days, we'll be back at this project again and we will be able to have it all boarded, mudded and drywall. I don't know about you guys, but mudding is probably my least favorite. Well, it's, and actually the mudding isn't so bad. It's the sanding and all the dust when you're doing drywall. Ugh, not looking forward to that. We are going to stop and have a lunch break now, but I'll be back with you guys again shortly. Okay, we are now going to fix our camera a little bit so we can see better. There we go. We are now finished lunch. I have had a lovely rest and got the rest of the dishes done. And now we are going to add our honey to our elderberry syrup. Whoops. And go easy on the amount of um, honey that you add to your elderberry syrup. I'm only going to add a tablespoon to start and then I'll taste it because it can get very sweet very fast. And actually while I'm doing this, I'm going to broil the top of my meatloaf, I make sure that I set a timer every time I broil in the oven, even if it's just gonna be for a minute, because if I don't, I inevitably get distracted with something and then I end up over cooking or outright burning whatever it is I have in the oven. Okay, we'll give that a little taste. Okay, so that could add a little bit more sweetener to it. So another tablespoon in there. You can cook this down and add way more sweetener to it and make it like a genuine syrup, but I am not doing that. And that would probably help a little bit with the vegetable sort of flavor that I find elderberries have. One of my kids said it tastes a little bit like spinach. Like it has like a really leafy kind of flavor to it. But I know lots of people who love it. I'm just not one of them. Pour it into a jar and then I will put this in the refrigerator. I make up my elderberry syrup like this fresh. So when we start coming down with something or whatever and we'll use it up within a week or so. I'm not sure how long it would actually last in the fridge, but not that long, unless you're making an actual syrup with tons of sugar in it. That would last a lot longer and then you could can it up. But I really want to have as much of the nutritional value in this as possible, which is why I cook it for as little as I do and uh, why we use it up right away and why I make it fresh every time we need it. I don't reuse canning lids on my canning, but I certainly would if I ever had to, and I would be a lot more careful about how I took them off so I didn't bend the lids up or anything like that. But I do use them for, or I do save some and use them for dry goods and things like that that I'm going to be putting in the fridge. I also keep a couple of rings usually, although this time I didn't have any in this drawer here, so that I can pull them out so that when we have, what would be an example? Uh, something like relish 
that we're not using up all at the same time. I can put a ring on it to store it in the fridge. As you saw in my pantry tour video, I don't store any of my jars with rings on them. And I had tons of people ask why they didn't have rings. People thinking that you needed the ring in order to hold the lid on, but no, you actually don't. The canning process itself is what seals the lid so that you can't take it off. And a lid can give it what's called a false seal. So you really wanna take your rings off after they're, they're um, done being canned and they've sat for 24 hours and then test all your lids to make sure everything's sealed properly. And then you can just wash your rings up and put them aside for the next year. I am very excited to try these. They're so delicious. I am going to cut a little piece of this right now. My mom made meatloaf a lot when I was a kid, so it is very much a comfort food for me. Yummy. I think this could have done without the extra salt that I added, so I added the salt, the um, garlic salt, and then I also added the other salt, and I could have gotten away with not adding just the plain salt, because it is pretty salty, but it's still really, really good. Mm -mm -mm. Dan just went outside to go and feed the cows. Do you guys want to go see the cows being fed? I think I showed you that we're feeding them out now because we got that early snow. Oftentimes we won't start feeding them out until the snow gets too deep for them to be able to eat off of the fields, but this year we got that early snow, so we're feeding them out now. We're gonna have to move really fast though because he's already getting the hay onto the tractor. Sadly, we missed the actual action. It's really cute because the cows know the sound of the tractor, so they run up to the fence to uh, chase the tractor down with the hay. And then you have to move really fast to get the bale twine off of the hay bale. But we'll go down and say hi to everybody anyway. What do you have stuck in your mane? Getting into the festive season early. Getting some garland on your mane. There we go. This is Moonstorm. This cute little girl here is Freya. Hey Freya. What a nice girl you are. And this is Poppy, and this is actually Poppy's calf. Poppy was bred to a black Angus, and this is what we ended up getting. Poppy is a Holstein. Hey, Poppy. Kind of the typical milk cow look. This is Ivy, our old horse. She is 20 six years old and has burdock. You have burdock in your mane. Let me get that burdock out for you. There you go. Oh, you have some up here too. The burdock was really bad this year and the horses and the cows had burdock in their mane. I'm gonna have to use both hands for this. One second. Girl, how on earth did you get this so matted into your hair? Ugh. With burdock, it seems like it's not gonna come out. And you just gotta keep working it, cause it will. Almost got it, honey. Hang on, almost got it. Ugh, there we go. Now you're looking a little worse for wear. <laughs> now you got a seriously messy do, girl. And then this is our Jersey bull right here. And he will be breeding all of our girls this year, or next year, sorry, for 2023. Last year we bred to a black Angus. We ended up with one, this is a black Angus Jersey cross. And then the two red calves that I just showed you were also thrown. Next year, hopefully we end up with lots of heifers because they'll all be milk cow babies. Delicious is it good? I thought it was too salty. You didn't think it was too salty? Oh, Dan is feeling much better which is so great. I was just showing them the, um, the room downstairs and pointing out how lovely it looks. It is coming along. All right, could you boil enough water for me too? We'll have a cup of tea. Relatively. All right. I was thinking of doing pan fried potatoes with this and some steamed broccoli. 
But because we had the potatoes in the soup, I've actually decided to do rice instead. Because rice and steamed broccoli are so easy to do, I'm just gonna wait, it's three o'clock right now, so I'm just gonna wait until closer to supper time to make that. Did you see this sloth? It's so cute, I love it, it's awesome. I know, <laughs> it's wonderful. All right, everyone, that is it for today's video. I hope you enjoyed it, and I look forward to seeing you in the next one. Bye.